Hello everyone, I'm Christa van Eisendorn. I'm a PhD student at Delft University of Technology. And today I'll be talking to you about grain size dynamics in the intertidal zone. And specifically, we're going to focus on vertical variability in grain size due to marine and aeolian processes. Where you, uh, you see me here on the beach during field work, and we're going to be talking about the results I got from this field work. To provide some context, I'm a PhD student in the June 1st project, and our overall aim is to work towards an integrated coastal zone model that can predict changes to the coastal profile. And my project specifically is focusing on the foreshore interface, where both marine processes and aeolian processes overlap. And we're looking at that intertidal zone uh, because it's an important source of sediment for aeolian transport from uh, offshore to the dunes. And in that way, it influences how the coastal profile changes. Now, there are several important factors that determine uh, whether there is element transport from the intertidal zone uh, on shore. For instance, moisture content and grain size. Today, we're specifically focusing on grain size uh, because if there's aeolian sediment transport and there's only heavy, coarse grains, there's less transport than when there's fine grains available that are lighter and easier to move by the wind. What we've, um, what we've seen in research um, as well is that the upper layer for aeolian transport is very important. So the upper few millimeters uh, determine whether uh, grains are available for aeolian transport. So what we're going to do here uh, is that we're going to look at the upper few centimeters of the beach in the intertidal zone and measure the grain size variations that happen there. And we want to relate those to environmental conditions, so waves, tides, and wind, to see what the influence of marine and aeolian processes are on the grain size distribution to know what kind of sediment is available for uh, transport from the intertidal zone on shore. Well, how did we do this? Um, we built a custom sand scraper. We had our uh, technician uh, develop um, and design this for us, and he came up with a, a great instrument. What you can see in the upper right is that we have a sort of bottom plate, and then uh, and that was number one, and then an internal mechanism, number two, that goes into that bottom plate. In the upper left, you see a, a, a turning scraper that really can take away the uh, a couple of centimeters, a couple of millimeters from the surface and put it in a, in a sample bag. You can see that in the lower left as well that we have a depth scale that goes in intervals of two millimeters. And, so, and in that way we can layer by layer remove the surface of the beach. You can see in the lower right that when we're done, we have a bit of a hole in the beach because we've been removing those layers. This is just an example of what the results uh, kind of look like so you get a better idea. We focus a bit more on the upper part of the beach. So there we have two millimeter intervals and then to the deeper parts, we have intervals of six millimeters and we go up to five centimeters deep. So about two inches. What we see here is two different columns. On the left, we have an example where there is a gradient from smaller to a bit coarser and to back to somewhat finer grains again. And in the right, we see an example of a location that had very fine grains at the top and somewhat um, coarser grains towards the bottom. Well, when are we going to do these measurements? What we want is we want to catch the influence of the marine processes and the influence of the aeolian transport on the grain size distribution. For that, we measure uh, first before and after the high water, because during the high water, the marine processes are at play and they influence the grain size distribution. And for the aeolian transport, uh, we don't want our intertidal zone 
uh, to be submerged. So we measure during low tide and we measure before and after low tide to see how uh, the wind um, worked on, on the grain sizes and how it changed the grain size distribution on the beach. Well, we didn't just sample in one spot. You can see in the upper right that along the coastal profile, uh, we actually measured at a couple of spots between low and high water. And then in the tidal cycle at the bottom, you can see that um, there's a bit of a differentiation in the times at which you then measure because some spots are submerged earlier than other or become dry later than, than the other spots. It's important to note that the samples I'm showing were taken at Noordwijk, the Netherlands. And the cool thing about that location is that we are working together with another project, Coast Scan, and they have a laser scanner on the top of a hotel there. So we can have hourly topographical information about the location we're working in. So first results. Uh, we're looking at the 5th of February 2020 here, and we're looking only at the marine influences. So we have in dark a profile that was taken before high water, in, in, in black, sorry, and then in dark gray, uh, the profile that was taken after the high water. Now there are three sample spots in this picture, and those are in indicated by the black triangles. Um, then for each black triangle, we have two columns with the grain size distribution uh, on the left for each of the sample points. The early one, so in the morning before high water, and then to the right of that um, after high water. What we see, uh, most importantly, is that there is a cross your variability in how much the grain size distribution changes in the vertical. The most seaward one, where there's also the most change in, in uh, topography, but we see that there is a big overhaul of the grain size distribution. Where first we had pretty coarse sediment on top, we now have finer sediment towards the top and the coarser sediment is at the bottom. But then for the middle sample point and the upper right one, we see that the grain size distribution has stayed relatively the same. There were some changes, but they were not as big as the one uh, on the seaward side. Then as well, we want to note that for the upper two millimeters, and you're, you got to believe me here a little bit, because it's very small, um, the upper two millimeters for each of these sample locations got finer after the high water. And in theory, that means that there was finer sediment available for aeolian transport after this high water. I cannot say how that will be in different uh, locations or at different times, because it completely depends, of course, on the environmental conditions. Then I have another day. And this is a this was a special day, because <laughs> here we had uh, we have both the high water and a low water with aeolian transport. This is the 21st of January 2021. We were there early in the morning before high water at 3 a.m. Then at 12 noon between the high and low water and then we measured after low water at 5 p.m. And here again the black line is the one is the earliest profile and the lightest gray is uh, after the low water the last measurement. Again we have three sample points and what we see now is that the grain sizes are way more uniform than in the last picture. So for the different day. Um, what I do want to note, because we see some quite big elevation changes in this profile, is that it's very important to take erosion and deposition into account when we're looking at that upper five centimeters. So what we did is, um, in this figure, correct for the elevation change that we see. And then it gets a little bit messy. Let's start with the upper right sample point. Because here we see that the, there was so much variation that the five centimeters that I have are uh, completely skewed, skewed um, compared to each other. 
So for this point, I cannot really say what's going on. It's going to be important to look more spatially to be able to explain what's happening here. Then for the middle one, we see that the, the left column has kind of disappeared. That's because it's really low, nearly underneath the graph, because there was a large increase in elevation, or relatively large. We're, we're talking about centimeters, decimeters, but for, for how I'm showing it here, it's a, it's a large change. Uh, but then for the middle and right column, we see that those were relatively stable. And we see that there's relatively fine sediment compared to the overall image here. Um, my guess actually here is that we're looking at fresh aeolian sediment uh, deposits. Um, I think that maybe the because the elevation, there's a bit of an elevation change between the, the two columns, the, the, the middle and the, and the right one, which can be caused by aeolian bed forms coming by along the beach because there was a lot of sediment transport going on. So depending on where I sampled on such an aeolian bed form, might have been that there's been a bit of a, a decrease in elevation and also a change in how much aeolian sediment was already uh, deposited there. Then the most interesting point is the left one. Um, we see that there's been a decrease in elevation throughout the, the three time periods. Uh, most importantly, on the left and in the middle, we have before and after high water that the elevation decreased and a lot of extra fine material became available in the upper centimeter, centimeter or two uh, after the high water. And then during the aeolian sediment transport, that those upper layers with fine sediment were all nearly all removed. So what we clearly see here is the effect of aeolian sediment transport on the grain size distribution. So for future analysis, because these were still preliminary results and there's quite some uh, stuff left to do, I want to look at the detailed profile development, which is going to be important to explain what's going on in those um, uh, in that upper right sample location where all the columns were screwed. And also it's going to be important to explain what's happening with the aeolian bed forms coming by uh, to know what I'm actually sampling. Then it's going to be uh, one of my next step is including environmental conditions because I now show two different days and there were probably different wave conditions and I will need to compare those to be able to say uh, how what the high tide had for influence. Then I need to check the spatial variability of the grain sizes in the, the in, in those upper five millimeter, five centimeters because what I now show this as if I was sampling on one straight profile, but it's an intrusive method and I'm removing sediment. So I didn't sample at exactly the same spot. I did do some checks and I think the differences were about 10 to 20 uh, micrometers if I sampled one meter apart, but I need to look into that a little bit more. Then of course these results are promising, so I want to look at different environmental conditions, different locations, see how this works in other locations. There's a lot to do here, uh, and I'm looking forward to trying it out at, at different beaches. Then um, I want to relate the changes in grain size that we saw here to aeolian sediment transports. So what do these changes in grain size mean for the prediction of aeolian transport? And probably I'm going to do that by implementing those changes in grain size into an aeolian model like AOS. For now, preliminary conclusions. We saw an increase of availability of fine grains after a high water. We saw removal of finer grains during aeolian transport. Um, and overall, for the bigger picture, uh, it's very important to remember that there's these vertical samples show large spatial and temporal variation and that these show effects of marine and the transport. So what I want you to 
know next time that you're thinking about beach sand and you think, oh, it's pretty uniform. Uh, remember all the colorful pictures that I showed you? There's a lot going on in the grain size distribution on the beach. Thank you very much for your attention.